want to begin with the story. It is affectionately known to University of Dayton students as the ghetto. This is where eight blocks of dilapidated two-story rental properties line the streets of the university's off-campus housing where upperclassmen live. My memory of the ghetto is sort of like this picture. I can recall one unseasonably warm Saturday in early September. The ghetto was hot. I mean, it was hot by humid, hot, and it was hopping. Thousands of students were flooding the streets and hanging out in four square blocks of the ghetto for a full day. And by a full day, from the wee morning to the wee evening, the whole day long they were partying. House after house sprouted tapped kegs of cheap beer. Music was thumping. Random hacky sack and volleyball games were being played. Guys were hitting on girls, and girls were flirting with guys. It was nuts, and that was the average life in the ghetto. I was 20 years old at the time, and I can remember traveling in a group of 10 guys from my fraternity getting ready to head out and join the huge mob of revelers. Leaving our house, we headed towards the thumping, blaring music. And there, on the corner of a crowded street, was a clean-shaven young man dressed in a white shirt, long sleeves, crisp collar, black tie, dress slacks. He was standing straight and tall next to an easel, holding a large paper board of white. A small group of rowdy, octane-fueled students were already gathered around him, laughing and mocking how he was dressed on such a balmy day. Dude, it's 90 degrees! Unbutton your shirt, man! Take off that tie and come join the rest of normal humanity. Live a little. Two of the guys I was walking with were curious, and they wanted to check out this compelling scene, the sideshow curiosity. The man ignored the taunting and boldly soldiered on over the heads of the belligerent crowds. His chin was held high, and his eyes were focused off of some far distant group, and he began shouting to an unknown listener, all mankind is lost in sin, he would say. We're all headed to hell, but there's a bridge that is available to escape. As he spoke, he proceeded to draw stick figures on that large board, a stick man standing on a hill crossing over a cross on a bridge with another hill where there's a bright sun and underneath flames of fire. One impatient man in a group was watching, squeezing a plastic red cup full of beer in his right hand. From the way he was swaying, this was not his first drink. He yelled at the white-shirted guy and said, Who do you think you are? Hey, man, we're Christians too. And then he slung his full beer, hitting the man with the pale liquid square in the face. A couple more students added their half-drunk cups to the beer drenching as well. As the man wiped off the beer that was dripping into his eyes, the crowd grew impatient. They had enough. So out of pity and boredom, they left him standing there at the corner alone with a stained white shirt soaking in cheap beer and ruined paperboard. As we continued walking away, one of the guys in my group commented on what he just saw. And he said, man, oh man, he sure picked the wrong place to try to push his religion. I'm a Christian too, but at least I know when to keep my mouth shut. Just as he's talking, he saw a porch also tapped with 10 kegs lined up. And there was a sea of young coeds running up and turning and talking. And he looked at us smiling and said, come on, guys, it's time to party. I'm getting hammered today. 
As I think back to that moment, I wonder, which person was being more of a true witness for Jesus Christ? The tie-wearing, joy-killer, standing on the corner yelling at people? Or the keg-chasing, beer-swilling Christian? Which one was doing more service for the cause of God's kingdom? I'm not sure either of them are good examples of how to catch a fish. We've been talking this month about going fishing. We're here at St. Pete's Lodge. This fire's kind of warm. I put it on this morning because I was freezing cold. It's kind of warm. Last week, Pastor Jared talked about the fish. And he said, all of you are a fish. Everybody born into this world is a fish. And not only a fish, but you're lost. We're desperately in trouble. And the wrath of God is hanging over us. That's what he said last week. Very clear. Well, in fishing, the next thing, you don't just talk about the fish. Today we're going to talk about the bait used to catch the fish. It's, very, it's going to be a very simple message. But before we go into it, I know what some of you are wondering. Remember, I've said this numerous times, I can read minds, and I know what you're wondering. Does Chris even know how to fish? I mean, Jared is the bluegill, the fish whisperer. He can catch any bluegill Maybe a couple he can catch, but he's, he can catch a fish. Does Chris even know how to, and remember he held up that picture with those rocket gun arms with the fish hanging? So I have visual evidence too today that I am really good at fishing too. Here it is, right here. <laughs> there it is. See, where Jared uses a pole, I became the bait. I'm, I'm fishing there on Orca. If you have never seen Jaws, that's some, I actually, uh, I did that. Computer, computer enhanced image. But there was a time when I remember what it was like being bait. My, my dad, my dad and um, he took us to Virginia Beach, Virginia, and we got this cottage, a rental college cottage for the summer. And there was an intercoastal waterway in Virginia Beach where there were crabs, blue crabs, a lot of them. And he loved catching blue crabs. And what we do is we go to a pier, we'd nail about 10 nails on the wood of the pier, then we'd tie a string, and on the other side of the string, we'd tie a rotten piece of chicken. We'd let the chicken stay out all night, we'd tie it, and then you'd throw it into the water. And what happens is the crabs, they're sort, they don't want to be seen in the sun, but what happens is they're so hungry, they grab that chicken and they crawl it out to the deep to gnaw on it. But while you're on the pier, you see the string tighten gets tighter and tighter and tighter. It gets really tight. You know that crab has it. And so what you do is you take that string and you slowly lead it back. Slowly lead it back. And then as you lead it back, you pretty soon see in the murky water a blue back shell of the blue crab. And then at that time what happens is you take the net and dip it in and grab it and there you got a, a, a crab that's going like that and you put it in the cooler and it goes and then you take it home you put it in the water and boil it it's fun it's a fun thing but anyhow one time my dad had this big crab he's slowly pulling it in slowly pulling it in and you can see it it's big you can see it's blue back and he goes chris i don't think i can take it anymore because it's resisting get the net and extend it as far as you can so i got the net you know how you Take an aluminum net, and you hit the knob, and you bring it all the way to the end and click it at the top. And he said, lean in there. Lean over the edge of the pier and lean in there. And I couldn't. I had eight years old, stubby arm. Like, Dad, I can't get it. He goes, really, lean in there. Come on, man. You know, and your dad wants that crab. He yells, come on. So I went in there, and I fell head first into the water. And I'm eight years old, and I come out screaming, ah, they're, they're eating me. The crabs are eating me. So I know what it means to be bait. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about bait, and our discussion is going to be really simple. In this first illustration, if you get this, I really don't need to say anything else, but let's just walk through it simply. And so the question is, to catch a fish with a hook, you need some bait. So what is bait? What are the basics of bait? What is so compelling about bait? I was talking to some expert fishermen about this, and um, 
some said it's pretty straightforward, even though there are a few that bait, bait X differently on different fish, but the majority of fish attack the bait and get hooked to the worm for two main reasons. Number one, their hunger is aroused. So bait arouses hunger. When it sees it, actually one fisherman said, in a way it kind of compels curiosity. Sometimes even fish, they may not be hungry, but they're curious, so they go and grab it. But the first thing bait does, it arouses curiosity. So when the fish sees the bait, it's interested. Hmm. When it sees that squiggling, squirming wood on the line, it says, I want, I want it. I has to have it. <laughs> Second thing about bait, corollary to the first, is it's tasty to the fish. It's something that the fish knows will bring pleasure to it, or you could say it's an attractive choice for the fish to take. So stop on those two things for a second. And then, how do you catch men the same way? The same way. If a fish sees bait that arouses hunger and is presented with something that the fish craves, then the fish will bite. If we are to catch men, our bait has to work in the same way. It must arouse hunger in the soul, and it must offer something that is satisfying to the soul. It must arouse hunger in the soul, and it must offer something that actually fills the soul. So let's think about it. What do you think we use to catch human? The Bible gives us two things, and here they are. But remember, they don't work if the person you're trying to catch is not interested in what you're presenting. I'll say that again. This bait won't work if the person is not interested in what you're trying to presenting. You will never reach a disinterested, a non-curious soul. And if you just apply that to most of Christianity, most of Christianity doesn't really arouse curiosity on a large degree. A lot of Christians go through life like robots, like you're uh, throwing a Lincoln log on the end of a hook to catch a fish. <laughs> Anyhow, let's keep going. The man, the man is the first side, or the woman, or the person, and the message is the second part of the bait, the, the words that are said, the actual story that is being presented. In some sense, you could say the man must be able to have a life that's so different that he's noticeable, and he arouses, his, his living has to be a good different. If Jared last week gave the analogy, fish are like a school of fish, we're caught into this current, and we're all flowing in the same way. We all believe the same things. We're all lust-driven. We all want riches. We all want this. And then all of a sudden, somebody going the other way who doesn't live like that causes curiosity. So it has to be a good different. And then the second thing, the message itself, has to be good news, not more bad news. If you believe in this message, then on a hot summer day, you too need to wear that white shirt and a tie. Well, that's not, a, is that the, our message? And then the message that is being used as bait needs to offer something. Something the person wants. Something the soul is hungry for. Something that will satisfy. So let's begin going more in depth to both sides of this bait. It's really a simple message. It's these two things, but it's you. You are the bait. You are the man. You are the woman. You are the person that God has sent to compel. So let's talk about the man. So when it comes to being the bait, individually, there are some things you need to know, two things that are crucial about being the bait. And we find them in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 to 17. Let's turn there and let's read it. This is written specifically by the Apostle Paul. He's talking about himself. But I believe it's also used in a, it should be used in a general sense about you as well, all of our lives. Because Paul, in many places in Scripture, says, follow my example. Imitate me. And here's his example, starting in verse 14 to 17, 
2 Corinthians chapter 2. This is a fascinating passage. It says, uh, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us, through you, spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ, the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, to one with a fragrance of death to death. Some people say the stench of death. To others, we are the uh, perfume of life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? Meaning this is it's a big responsibility. Then verse 17, For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. So we're going to go through this. But the general idea when you read it is, first of all, the first thing we're going to talk about is if you're going to be bait, you need to know you always smell. You give off some kind of smell. So you can say it like this. Never forget you're always giving off a smell. You're a fragrance. Whether you want to be or not, people smell this, the odor you're presenting about Christianity. It's very interesting, as one commentator was saying, this is talking about not the sense of sight. We often think witnessing or telling people about Christ is about how I present myself, how I look, what I'm wearing, how I cut my hair, or how our church looks. But this person says the sense he's talking about is the sense of smell, what comes from you. What you exude, people just know it. There's something about smell when you walk past a person. You don't see it, but you can walk past it and you'll go, there's just something. Or, wow, hey, it's that kind of thing. What kind of, what kind of smell do you give off to people? I, wanna, I have to explain these metaphors so you'll get what he's saying, and then we'll go into how you know how you smell, how you determine your smell. But the first thing in verse 14 he uses a really strange metaphor. He says, thanks be to God, who in Christ, in Christ is a prepositional phrase, which means somebody who's saved, somebody whose life is hidden in Christ, somebody who believed in Jesus. So he's saying, thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. Triumphal procession. What is that talking about? Oh, we're, we're victors. We are victors. We are led in triumph. Actually, it has not, it's almost the opposite, believe it or not. Here's what he's talking about. In Rome, they had what are called triumphal processions. So let's say the Roman army is fighting the barbarians, and the Roman army destroys the barbarians. What they do is they take the barbarians captive, put chains around their neck, on their feet, and then they lead them in a parade into the city of Rome. And all of the captives are being led in triumphal procession because behind the captives is Caesar, and the general that won. And behind him are all of his captains. But the people that are being led are, are the ones who are going to the temple of Jupiter to get slain. And while they are walking there, the Roman citizens are hurling insults, mocking and laughing at them. In a way, their lives are embarrassing. But Paul's saying, that's, my, that's what I am. That's me. One writer puts it like this. Paul himself is seen as one of the captured of the great king, being publicly paraded through the streets. In other words, Paul is a conquered slave of Christ, a trophy of the great king's victory, a joy to the king's people and a stench to his foes. He's captive bond slave being dragged around as a servant. So what he's saying is that Paul himself, he's seen differently. By some people, he's seen as, man, he is Christ's servant. By some people, man, he is a Christian. <laughs> and then he uses this other phrase, this fragrance idea in verse 14, at the end, the fragrance of knowledge. In 15, the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. The fragrance of death to death. In most commentators saying this is now using another metaphor of the sacrificial system in the Old Testament. And this is fascinating to me. If I sin in the Old Testament, I take my best animal and I kill it. So I'd take a, a nice cow or a bull and I'd kill it. And I would bring the meat 
the good parts of the meat to the priest as a burnt sacrifice or fellowship sacrifice. And he would take that good meat and basically offer it on an altar. And an altar is a barbecue. So you take good meat on a barbecue and you can smell the aroma and it's good. Man, that smells good. Have you ever been to Logan's when they're pumping that air? Right around now is a great time to talk about it, isn't it? When they're pumping that air of that salted steak T-bone that has been laced with butter gravy on top, you just smell it when it's fried. Oh, that's good. So everybody who's a able to go into the temple can smell that aroma. Oh, that's good meat. What do you do with the intestines and the hind legs and the, the hide of the animal? They go outside the city and they throw it in the Valley of Hymnon where it's a fire forever. What does that smell like? That stinks. So those outside the camp smell the stink of the sacrifice. Those who are inside the camp smell the aroma, the pleasure of the sacrifice. So you put these two metaphors together, the triumphal procession, meaning basically he's using this to say my life of Christianity is one of suffering, foolishness, I'm kind of looking down upon. But it also, there's a fragrance to it. And so I want to bring those together and say that your life also has a fragrance. And I want to help you determine what you smell like. So you either smell like a stinky fish or you smell like a fresh fish. You smell like, you know, if you go to, um, if you go to a good fisherman's wharf or something, you'll see the salmon on the ice. It's fresh. That's a fresh fish. But then you get some rotten ones, and they usually throw it in the slop in the back, and all those feral cats are jumping around on it and fighting for it. That's the stinky fish. So which one are you? There's four categories. We're going to talk about two kind of people, and this isn't talking about non-Christians. This is talking about people inside the church. And I believe inside the church there's two kinds of people. There's those who really live godly lives, who really follow Christ who really do give up things for his name. And then you have hypocrites. Hypocrites who are, it's pretty easy. Hypocrites put on the show. They put on the coat. Oh, come Sunday. But they hide Monday through, especially Friday night and Saturday with everybody else. It's that kid who went to the keg party. How does the, how do they smell to the noses of the saved and the unsaved? Because they each give off a different stench. What this verse says is a godly life To the saved, smells fresh. It's amazing. You can, if you see somebody sacrificing, giving things up, loving people that nobody else would love, really being patient with people and kind. Other Christians look at that person and say, wow, what an example, or wow, what a worthy God for this person to sacrifice so much for him. He must be that good if this person is willing to subject their life to him. He must be worth it for a good man to give up what he he could have. He could have pleasure galore, but he gives it up because he wants to serve Christ. There's a genuine depth of soul in a fresh fish. You just know it. It's compelling. It's intriguing. When you meet a really godly person and they walk by, I don't know how to explain it, you just know it. They're strong. But when you meet a a godly person to the nose of the lost, according to this, they smell like death. And the reason they smell like death is there's a comparison going on. I don't want to live like that. I don't, don't, they sacrifice too much. You can hear people say stuff like, yeah, I don't want any part of that kind of life. I don't want to be humbled. I don't want to be broken and despised. Who would want to give up power, prestige, position, popularity, my possession to follow a God I can't see? What a waste. And so what they do is when they see a really real Christian, they realize to be like that, I've got to give up too much. I don't want to do it. And I, get them out of here. Like there's almost an anger. They smell like death. But then you have the hypocrite. What does the hypocrite smell like to the saved? That guy over there, I know what he does on the weekends. He's good at the show, but you know what? I don't really want to associate with him. I know who he is. 
He puts on a good show, but I, I know really who he is. But here's the, here's the really interesting thing, and I've seen this. I have seen this so true in life, and this is something hypocrites don't think about. Do you know how the hypocrite smells to the non-Christian or the unsaved? Kind of like, um, like they caught a little, like they kind of laugh, laugh at him. Like, you, you know what? You really don't know what you believe. You're not that interesting of a person. Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna be a non-Christian, go all the way. Luther would say, if you're gonna go to hell, go all the way to hell. It's so much more interesting. You're so much more compelling. You're so much more honest. You're so much more honest. So which one are you? The second thing this section says in verse 17, I think, is really interesting. What we first thing we learned is never forget you're always giving off a smell. The second thing we're going to learn in verse 17 is this is that people can sense if you've been genuinely sent. Look at, look at what verse 17 says. This is my verse for this year. He's talking about how we present the gospel, specifically the apostles, preachers, but you're to imitate that, and you too. And he says, for we are not like so many. At the time this was written, there were what are called super apostles, these guys that came in, it would be the Joel Osteens and the Benny Hens of the day coming in and impressing everybody. Because Paul wasn't impressive, really. He said he wasn't that eloquent. I imagine Paul kind of being an old guy, kind of hunched over a little bit, probably had a beard. I imagine him having a bald head. I don't know why. It's nothing against bald heads. I imagine him looking exactly like Dan Spolstra. Anyhow, but I imagine it, you know, like there's no, you know, no toupee, no three-point, no uh, three-piece suit, no gold Rolex watches. Listen to what he says. For we are not like so many. That, that phrase, so many, is interesting, meaning there's a lot of people who peddle the word of God. A peddler is a person who's, it's kind of like, you know, in the 1920s when people would come and they'd have those stand-up tables. They'd open up the suitcase and they'd have tonic. You want some tonic? It only costs you 100 bucks. You drink this tonic, you'll live for next 20 extra years. Get it now. That's that huckster. It's a huckster. That's what this means. Peddling is, I'm not lying to you. I'm not trying to just make money off a stupid product. But we are to be men of sincerity this word sincerity means there's nothing false. I'm trying to communicate what I really believe. I know it to be true. I know, I know if I could rip out the ceiling right now and be able to have a view up into heaven, there is Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. I know he's there. I know he can look down on us and he can, he can hear what's in our minds right now. I know there's... Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity that lives in me, in, in any believer in here. That same God who moved across the waters of the earth in Genesis 1 and made it alive. That's something to believe that. And people can tell when you believe that. They can. So it says, For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, were sent, we're his ambassadors. He sent us. In the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Not in the sight of men. In the sight, God is the audience of one. I'm really not, in a sense, speaking to you. I have a tendency where I want you to like what I say, so I want to make it, you know, interesting. But truthfully, I'm not accountable to you. I'm accountable to God. When I die, He's going to say, "Why did you lie? Why didn't you tell Him the truth?" So you could say this: If you are going to be a proper person sent. Don't forget, no matter, no matter if you believe it or not, you're giving off some kind of smell. One person said, those people who don't want to be politi play politics are still playing politics. The idea is that, you know, politics is being nice, shaking hands, and being kind. I'm not going to play politics, so I'm just going to be a jerk. Well, you're playing politics. People just won't like you. The same way, I'm not going to, I don't give off a smell. I'm going to kind of just be me. 
well, that's given off a smell. And second thing, people can have can sense if you've really been sent, if you really are sincere and you believe it. They know. They just know. They just, they just know. Second thing, second bait isn't just the man, it's also the message. And we find this in Romans chapter 1. Romans 1 gives us why, why this message is so compelling. Because the idea, if we are sent, we're like this boy on this picture. We are like heralds who are given a word from the king. Listen! Everybody listen! That's kind of what he's saying. He, hey! Jesus is coming back again. When Jesus comes back again, he's going to bring his rewards with him. He really is. So we are, we are sent to give the message of the king. That's why we're sent. And why, here's why Paul, here's the motivation why Paul gives it, starting in verse 14 of chapter 1 of Romans. He says, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and barbarians both to the wise and to the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not embarrassed by it. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so really the message, the message is when it's presented right, it is compelling and it gives us the reasons why. And I'm going to go into those, but before we go in there, I've got to deal with this word in verse 14 that is the prime obstacle, why we don't usually share. Because we really don't see it as an obligation. This word obligation is not in our nature. This word obligation means I'm a debtor. I owe. And you know what? It's not that we owe to God. It says I am, I am under obligation to the people, to Greeks. So I owe them. Why do I owe them? Because when I received the gospel, I didn't deserve it. It was free. Who am I now to hoard it and keep it to myself? It sort of, if you think, I like to think about it like this. Imagine God made this beautiful earth and he starts sending people on the earth and he makes this giant lake. The first person who gets to the lake sets up a house by the lake sets up a giant fence around the lake and then starts charging everybody to go swimming and drinking from that lake and gets rich off of something he was given. The talents you've been given by God are gifts. And I'm not going into a political thing. That's not my point. But it's to say we are adverse to obligation. We don't buy it. Here's another illustration. I think this will help a little bit better. This is one I heard a long time ago. Imagine you're in a desert. You're dying. You're almost skeletonish. Your clothes are tattered or torn. You're dusty and dirty. And you're blind. So you're stumbling around. The wind's blowing. And you're dying of thirst. And then you stumble and you fall into this pool. When you fall into this pool... You kind of wipe your eyes and you start drinking and you can see. And this pool not only, not only tastes sweet and it's good, but it puts flesh back on your once skeletal bones that clothes you're wearing all of a sudden kind of regenerate themselves. And you get stronger and you drink more. And the more you drink, the stronger you get. Then you look behind you and there's, you can see. And you can see hundreds of thousands of people blind and walking around in this desert like that. What do you do? I'm just going to stay here in this lake because it's really good here. Let them, let them suffer. Aren't you obligated? Aren't you obligated? This is the hardest part. So if we can get past obligation and Jesus says we're ambassadors, then... We know why we're sent. We're sent for two reasons because this message offers two things. Number one, a uni- it's a universal message, meaning it 
It's for everybody. For the Jews first, for the Greeks. It's for people with black skin and white skin and blotched skin and burnt skin. And everybody who has red blood, this, is, this message is for. It's for females. This message is for males. This message is for non-binary, uh, fluid gender people. This is for people who are attracted to the same sex and opposite sex. This message is for everybody. It's universal. And it's for screwed up people. It's especially for screwed up people. People who failed people who don't feel they deserve anything. It's especially for you. Because really, you'll be the first one to take it because you realize you're stuck in that desert blind. It's for you. And if the gospel is presented right, it should be exactly what a starving soul wants. Rescue from the wrath of God and from sin. And the second thing, it has power. It has power. So when I take this message and I, in a way, I'm going to put it like this, when I bite on it like a fish, when I eat it, when I ingest it, it says here that um, it has the power of salvation. It, it, it's like a, to me, it's like a little seed when it goes into me, it plants itself in my heart and I start growing into this eternal oak that one day is going to live in heaven with a body that will never die. Because I believed in that message. What is the message? It's very simple. If you don't know what the message is, it's, it's that symbol we have right up there. So this symbol represents my punishment. I deserve that. It's actually, this isn't a thing to wear around your neck. It's actually an electric chair, an ancient, old-fashioned electric chair. But that was meant for me. And then somebody loved me, and as I was getting ready, right before they're going to nail me, this guy pushed me off and took my nails. And this really happened. It happened um, 2,000 years ago, longer than that. Happened by a guy named Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he died. And right before he died, they took a spear to plunge in his side to see if he really was dead, and he was. And he was on the cross for three hours. And what's interesting about that, here's what Scripture says. When he was hanging on that cross three hours, and I I like the, if you can imagine you have this cross and a single beam, a single channel or tube of wrath is pounding him. While everything else around him is dark, it's pounding him and that wrath was meant for me. And he did that for three and a half hours and it killed him and it killed him so much that they buried him in a tomb they put him in this, like, stone tomb, and they put him in there, and they rolled the stone. And he was in there three days. Because he said he would be, first of all, and Old Testament said he'd be in there three days. And then these ladies who loved him went to, he, like a fish, they knew he'd start stinking, so they went to his tomb to put oils and fragrances on him, herbs, frankincense, myrrh, that kind of stuff. But they got to the tomb, and the stone was rolled away, and there's nobody in there. And these two angels appeared and said, he's not here, he's alive. And then he showed up to his disciples, and he said, I'm alive, I'm resurrected, and if you believe in me, all who believe in me can have the power to be like me, to be resurrected too. That's our message. It's amazing. But that's the message. We call that, according to verse 16, salvation. Salvation means being delivered. Being delivered like from the death of that desert where I was a skeleton, blind, dying. It has power. In the message is a chance of new life. When you present the message, the question is to the person listening, does it sound like good news or a scam job? There's a tendency of the church to say the same thing all the time. I remember when I was a kid, I'd, I really didn't know the I mean, I went to a Christian church, but I didn't really understand it. I'd turn on the TV, and on the TV would be people that would say the name Jesus like this. Jesus. Jesus. And they'd whisper in the ears of people, say Jesus. I'm like, what is that, honestly? 
As a kid, I would say, I hate that on my heart. I, it's so wrong. There's something wrong about that. Or the people that would go to church and I knew who they were. And they would be really, really holy on Sunday. But man, they'd, they'd curse at you in the afternoon, you know, like the whole rest of the week. And so really the, bio, the gospel's a scam job. It's really not changing lives. It's just this strange message that people think there's... Do you believe it? Gospel, if you present it as clearly as possible, and if your life is compelling in the sense that you are a good different, people will start to bite because they'll smell a difference. Do you remember I opened up with that story of those 10 guys? They were all from my same fraternity. And there was one guy there. His name was Jeff. Well, we all graduated the University of Dayton. We all went our own ways. Jeff became an accountant in downtown Chicago. He worked for a high-end accounting firm in Chicago. After I got saved, I, uh, after a couple years I got saved, I went to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago to study the Bible. But what happened is I started losing these friends because I kind of started smelling like death to them. They're like, what are you doing up there? You're studying the Bible? And then I got a call from some of these same guys saying, hey, we're having a reunion in Chicago. It's right by your school on Division and Rush Street. Will you come? It's in an Irish bar. I said, I don't want to go. They said, man, we just want to see you. We haven't seen you in years. Come on. I'm like, oh, man, I don't want to go. I went. And as I went, I had some other students pray for me. And I walked into this Irish bar, and they were saying, the green alligator, the long neck beak. If you know that song, it's a great drunken Irish song. And they had all these, they had all these kegs of beer. And all, hey, I walk in, hey, there he is. We haven't seen that guy. Are you on the street corners preaching in a white long shirt and a tie? You're one of those guys, aren't you? I said, no, but I do believe the gospel. I, and I had a guy say, oh, so that means if I don't believe in Jesus, what happens to me? Ha huh, ha, huh? and they're baiting me because they are drinking out of those same red cups. Huh? What do you think? Am I going to go to hell? I said, yeah, yeah. Oh, I knew it. I knew it. You know, and it was crazy. And the longer you're there, the more they drink from those red cups. And then they start crying. They think you're a priest, and they confess to you. It's crazy. Oh, you know, I, you know like, I, I don't want this. So I went out of there, I left, I'm like, oh, I'm glad I'm done with that. Two days later, I get a call, hello, hi, this is Jeff. Jeff, how you doing? He goes, I was there. I didn't talk to you, because I was watching you. What do you mean? Well, my life's a mess. My dad left my mom for my mom's sister, and he shacked up with my aunt, and I don't know what to do. And all my family's okay with it, and I'm not. It's breaking my soul apart, and I need answers. And I was watching you, and I think you might have answers. I'll meet with you, Jeff, if you come on over. So he came over to my house for six weeks in the morning, once a week, and he'd have a whole legal pad of questions. And they were all about God. I brought Michelle to meet with him a couple times. And we were able to lead him to Christ. He got baptized in Lake Michigan. And now he's an elder at a church in Ohio. And I said, Jeff, why did you call me? He said, because you're different. And I think you really believe what you're telling everybody. My question for you is this. Will you be that one? While the whole world is going this way, will you be that one that just is different? Will you be bait is all I'm asking. 